Hello friends, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making at Eric Schaefer Guitars. We are going to be working on guitar number 86, our parlor guitar here. As promised in the last video we did, I will be slotting the nut. Okay, so that's what this whole video is going to be all about. Let's get right into it. We're going to start by opening up this nifty little pack of strings right here. I like Diodario Phosphor Bronze. Really, there's a wide variety of strings that I like. I don't have a, a very strong connection to anything in particular, but these are pretty standard. And Light Gauge, I also like. I pretty much use Light Gauge on almost everything. Occasionally, though, I'll use a set of 13s, which is considered medium gauge. Medium and light doesn't really tell the story accurately because most people use light gauge. So honestly, if we're being honest with ourselves, we should just call light gauge medium gauge. It's very confusing. All right, let's get started. And by the way, if you notice all that extra humming that you hear in here, it's because I am trying my damnedest to fight the heat that is emanating from all these windows right now. It is, I think, going up to like 96 today, and it's a cloudless sky, so the sun just hits these windows. And honestly, uh, if I walk back from these windows, I can actually feel the temperature drop. Unfortunately, my whole bench, <laughs> at least the one I want to be working at right now, is right up against these windows. I can, I can just feel the heat emanating from these windows, and we're already up at uh, 82 degrees indoors in here. What I'm saying is I need better air conditioning here in the shop. So buy more stuff from me so I can afford air conditioning. All right, so what we're doing now is simply installing the outside E-strings first. And the reason we're doing that is so we can lay out our overall string splay, basically the span of the strings from E to E. Whenever I install strings, I always give a little bend just past the extra windings near the ball end of the string. You give a little bend right there. Basically what you're doing is you're giving it a bend at the exact spot where it's going to naturally bend itself over time anyway. So what you're doing is you're helping with that break-in period for your string stretch. So you can see when I put that in there, you can see that bend begins right at the top of the hole where it's going to eventually kink there anyway. You will thank me when it doesn't take you two days to stabilize your tuning. That's what this helps with. Also stretching your strings after you install them also helps with that. So what we're going to do is simply pull these two E strings in to where we want them to be. Basically, there's a certain distance from the bevel that we want the strings to stay. I'm going to mark that and then I'm going to cut a little starter notch to hold the string. Now, a sort of standard that a lot of people use for this is 3 30 seconds of an inch from the start of that bevel. But I always just eyeball this to get it to where I know it'll feel good. And by feel good, I mean, if you get too close to that bevel, I think we've all experienced this, where you play a certain guitar and the string can easily accidentally pop off that bevel and make a very awful sound, very out of tune sound, and uh, just makes your playing kind of gross sounding, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I'm just gonna pull this out and I can sight down the whole length here to make sure it looks good all across the board. Okay, mark that up. Doesn't matter that the string now kind of pulls to the side because we're gonna cut that notch in just a moment. But I'm gonna turn my attention to the other side and do the same thing. Okay, so to cut our starter notch, you can just use a small razor saw or you can just use the same files that you're gonna use to actually cut out the notches. Just use a really small one, like the size file that you would use for the 
treble E string, and we're gonna use this file to cut a little starter notch on both the treble E and the base E. So I'm just gonna place that right between my two lines. I can kind of wiggle it side to side to make sure it's centered. Yep, there we go. And if I feel like I'm off center between my two lines a little bit, I can always just tilt this a little bit and kind of push my notch in the direction that I want it to go. But it looks centered to me, so I'm just gonna deepen that a little bit. And it really doesn't need to be that deep at all. It just needs to be deep enough to hold that string, which now it's doing. All right, so let's do this one. Now, of course, this, this string is much wider. So we're going to have to roll the file a little bit to accommodate the extra width. Now you might think, oh, I'll just grab the file that I'm gonna use for this string, but that wide of a file, it's actually hard to get a firm start to your cut exactly where you want it to be without it slipping around. So it's easier to use this small file. So I'll get that centered. And first, I'm just gonna make a cut like before. And I can see them a little bit to this side here. So I'm gonna tilt this and push it that way. Okay, that looks pretty well centered. And now I'm just gonna kinda gently roll the file like this, which gives it the sort of girth that it needs to cradle the string. There it is. All right, so these will now hold our position so that I can mark out the other strings. Once we have the other strings all marked out, which I'm gonna do with the Stumax string spacing ruler, then I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make a tiny starter notch for each individual interior string. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So here's the Stumax string spacing ruler. Very easy to use, honestly worth getting. And you're gonna take this, and first you're just gonna kinda randomly pick a starting point. And so I'm gonna line up this notch right here with the center of my bass string. And if I count my six strings out, one, two, three, four, five, six, I can see that this notch here is just a little bit to the outside. I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera. And by the way, I'm only looking at the short marks right, not these tall ones in between. Move it down one, now I am looking at the tall ones. The tall and the short marks just make it easier to read this. So now I'm looking at only the tall ones, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, right there. That might look like it's dead on, but actually I can tell if I go just one more, because I know these marks are really fine. Like there's a very fine difference between one set of marks and the next one. So right here, now that is actually dead on. But you can always go one more, and I like to do that just to confirm that you were dead on, because now that I went one more, this mark is too far to the inside. So I'm gonna go back one. And yep, so that's it. Now I'm just gonna steady my hand. Okay, and just kind of double check your marks, make sure you like them. All right, that looks pretty good. Oh, and let me explain. So the reason this is necessary, by the way, this ruler, this might uh, trip you up a little bit because you might be wondering where are the numbers on this ruler and why aren't these marks evenly spaced? So the idea of this is not to get even, evenly spaced marks between your two strings because if you did, if your strings were evenly spaced out between their centers, then you would actually notice that the guitar feels much more cluttered around the bass strings than around the treble strings, and that's simply because the bass strings are wider. They take up more space. So what you actually need is sort of a graduated span between the strings as you go up towards the bass strings. They need to spread out just a little bit wider up in the bass area to accommodate the thickness. And that's what this does. Alright, 
So now with all the strings installed, I like to use the feeler gauge method of cutting my nut slots. And so what we're gonna do, the first thing is we need to use a set of feeler gauges. Uh, so starting out, I would have a full feeler gauge set like this. And I would determine from that full set how many feeler gauges or what combination of feeler gauges I can fit underneath a straight edge that rests on my first two frets. Why am I doing that? That is to determine with my feeler gauges the height of my fret tops. So I don't actually have to know what numbers I have here because these are all different thicknesses. This one's 13, this one's eight thousandths of an inch. That's 17. That doesn't really matter. I'm just kind of going to mess with different combinations until I get close, until I get to the point where the straight edge no longer rocks on the feeler gauge set. This is exactly the height of my fret tops. Now I don't want to cut my nut slots down to the height of my fret tops because then the string will literally just be resting on the fret tops and it's not going to play. So I'm just going to add seven. That's just a good standard. You can use six or eight depending on your confidence in this job or maybe you have bad eyesight or something like that. The poor eyesight can make cutting the nut slots a little bit more difficult. And so you can give yourself a little more leverage by using eight thousandths of an inch. If you're very confident, you can do six thousandths of an inch because in the end, after we cut all our nut slots, if you go a little bit higher, you can always sand the bottom of the nut if the nuts, nut action is a little too high. You can always sand the bottom of the nut in order to rein that in. Anyway, we're gonna do seven thousandths of an inch added to my feeler gauge set. So this whole thing right here is the height of our fret tops plus seven. And I'm gonna take my feeler gauge set and press it against the nut right there. And I like to flex the feeler gauge set against the fretboard, which will match it up to the radius I have on the fretboard. Okay, so if I just push down a little bit, and this pencil doesn't work. New pencil. If I just push down a little bit, I get that radius and I can trace it onto the nut. Now in the end, we're gonna be cutting our slots with the feeler gauge set in place just like you see it. I'll be holding it here and cutting, but for now I'm marking this with a pencil so that I can rough cut down to the line first uh, simply by pulling the nut out of here. We're gonna put it in a little vise and cut our slots 90% of the way and just return to the instrument here with it to do the final fine tuning. Okay, and now I've got the nut held in a nut slotting vise. The nut slotting vise is then held in my larger vise, my swivel vise. It doesn't have to be that way. I could just clamp this to the table and sit down. I find this very comfortable though, to do it this way. And by the way, you don't need a vise like this or this. You don't need either of these two things. As you're gonna see in the end, when I'm finishing up these slots over the guitar, you could actually do the whole cutting process like I do it in the end over the guitar itself. This is a little quicker to do the job this way. So I've got that in there. I've got my files all laid out. I like to, before I even start, just pick all the files that I need from my E string to my A string to my D, G, B, E, and just have them all laid out. The rule of thumb is this. You want the gauge of your file to either match the string that you are cutting the nut slot for or be larger, right? So if I had a 54 thousandths of an inch string, which I do for the ba base E string, and let's say I had a 53 thousandths of an inch file and a 60 thousandths of an inch file. In that case, you would want to use the 60 thousandths of an inch 
and not the 53. Because the 53, while it's really close to that size, it's under, it's smaller. And your string is not going to seat at the bottom of the notch if the notch is even slightly smaller than the string. So the same size or larger is always the answer. And it's actually totally fine to use a file that's not exactly the size of your string. There's no reason to get it super precise. Um, a few thousandths of an inch larger makes no difference. Well, that's it. There we go. We're ready to get started. Let's do it. I'm going to start out with my base E string here, although it doesn't matter. I could start out from the other side, the treble side, and that would be fine. And I'm going to take my file and I'm just going to first start my cut going flat like this. But as you're going to see, in the end, I need to ramp every slot. This is sort of the most important thing when it comes to nut slotting is that you ramp each slot in such a way so that the ramp or the slot peaks at the front edge, the fretboard facing edge of the nut. This is not like the saddle where it crowns in the middle and you have your break point in the middle of the saddle. On the nut, you actually want the break point of each string, basically the beginning of the speaking length of the string, to be at the front face of the nut. Very important. Otherwise, your intonation is going to be all over the place. Because if you just cut your slots flat all the way down, that break point is going to be somewhere sort of random. It might be on the front edge or in the middle. Um, if you ramp it, you guarantee that it breaks right where your scale length begins at the front of the nut. All right, so like I said, I'm starting flat though, just for a couple seconds to establish a nice uh, solid cup there or cradle for my file. And then once I have that, I can then turn it and angle it. It doesn't matter that you have a very specific angle to your cut here or to your ramp, just that it is pitched up. It could be very slight as long as you're sure that you do have an angle and it's not flat. Um, as you'll see in the end, because we'll be cutting this over the guitar in the end, something to eyeball is your headstock angle, right? I have a 15 degree headstock angle, so basically all my slots end up having about that angle cut into them. Other things to watch out for while I'm starting here is tipping. If I'm tipping like this or like that, then I'm actually moving my slot over. So if I'm going in this direction, I'm going to make my strings more crowded. If I'm going this way, I'm going to make my strings play too spread out. So you just want to be aware of that. It's all too easy as a human being. It's a very easy human error to have some sort of bias in the way you're holding this and to be cutting at an angle like that. So just make sure as much as you can control it that you're not tipping. And then watch your pencil line of course because that is our end destination here. Okay, and now we're ready for the home stretch here. Just the final refinement of these notches right down to the metal of our feeler gauges. And we're gonna do that with the nut in place. So I gotta get this back underneath the strings. Before I put it under there, I always like to erase that pencil line that we drew because we no longer need it. and. I've just noticed that it always makes it, if you leave it on there, it makes it a little bit harder to tell, to see when you're down to the line, uh, or I'm sorry, not down to the line, because there is no line, when you're down to the feeler gauge set. Okay, because now we're gonna be cutting right down to this metal without actually contacting the metal. 
All right, let's get this back underneath the strings. And I'm gonna see if I can get this in here without having to loosen these strings anymore. Uh, just because I'm lazy and I want to kind of jam it in there. All right, this will work. There we go. Okay, let's tighten these up. Nowhere near pitch. I just want all the strings taut. So basically once I get kind of a clear tone, then um, I know that that string is at least doing its part to clamp the nut into position. That's really the only reason why I'm doing this. And now the E string is the one we're gonna be working on so that I can leave loose. And I'm actually gonna pull it out and just kind of flop it over to the side. Now I've got my 54 thousandths of an inch file for my 54 thousandths of an inch string. And I'm going to go ahead and cut right down to my feeler gauge set. So again, this is the fret tops plus seven thousandths of an inch. Place that right there. And I'm going to gently press down on the feeler gauge set so that it conforms to the radius. Now I take my file and I'm already really close. So this is just to take it that last little bit. Again, I don't want to actually hit the file. I don't want to rely on the file as a hard backstop. Although, if I do get crazy, it at least limits how far below the line I can go. I can actually cut through the metal if I try to, <laughs> but um, you definitely kind of feel it once you hit the metal. And so you won't go too far past your line. But anyway, the real purpose of this metal is not to hit it, but it actually makes it a lot easier, as you'll see, to sneak up on the line and get really close to it. So and the reason that is, I'm gonna show you, here's the really cool trick of this. If you just kind of rub the metal a little bit and then view it like this, I can actually see a reflection of the notch in the metal. The metal is like a mirror and so let me see if I can show you this. Okay, I think, yeah, I think maybe you can see that right there. And I think I can make the case for this very clear for you simply by drawing this out on a piece of scrap wood real quick. So let's say this is our nut right here. And you know, there's a several notches, right? Okay, a nice childlike drawing there. And this is our feeler gauge sitting right in front of it. And if this wasn't a reflective material and we were just cutting down to say a pencil line, I would be staring at this sort of bridge of material underneath the notch and trying to get that right down to there. And depending on how well you can see that, you would have varying results, right? But I can actually 2x my vision. I can double my vision by looking at this reflection of the notch, right? Because I would have a reflection kind of like this right here. And so now this bridge of material that I just talked about is now double, okay? We have all of this to look at. I haven't actually increased the amount of material. I've just zoomed in essentially by doubling the picture. So now the goal is to get this notch to just barely kiss the reflection of it right here so that there effectively is no bridge of material in between the real notch and the upside down reflection of it. It's really cool actually in actual practice if you try this, you'll know what I mean. Okay, so let's now go ahead and just sneak up to our line here. Really only got a couple Careful strokes to go. Honestly, I think just one more. Okay, that's perfect. Now I replace that string and I can go ahead and tighten that up. Again, not tuning to pitch or anything, but just getting it taut so that it can hold the nut in place. Loosen up the next string 
the A string, pull that to the side. And now I'm gonna look for my 42 thousandths of an inch file, which I have right here. Place my feeler gauge set back in there, and away we go. folks so there we have it now we could be totally done right here we do have a functioning nut at this point but as a final step well a couple final steps it's a good idea to knock down the height of the nut at this point um, just so that the strings aren't resting in these like deep canyon walls right now those slots are pretty deep so we can just give it a haircut off the top in the end it should look more or less like the strings are resting on top of the nut rather than embedded down deep within it and as a general rule of thumb here i always keep some cuttings from strings and i have them labeled with tape um, as a general rule of thumb you want about a third of your E string. There's my E string. About a third sitting up above the nut. Right here, the whole string is down, you know, buried underneath the top surface. So I need to knock that down so that this string is resting uh, more like that. I don't know if you can see that on the camera well. So that a third is sitting up above and two thirds is down below. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly that, it could be a quarter above, three quarters below. But the point is a little bit sits up on above the surface and the rest is below. The reason that matters, by the way, one, it doesn't look very nice when you have this big chunky nut like that. And also, you ever get that like tink, 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 tink sound when you're tuning up a guitar? That's the nut binding up against those walls. Um, usually it's the nut binding up against those walls. And so if we decrease those steep canyon walls by a large amount, you generally don't have that problem. And so this is a quick, easy thing to do. You can either put this back in the nut slotting vise there and take a nice file like this this is a triangle file and we can just take that down with the file all the while checking with our individual piece of string but actually what i like to do is we'll just take this vise out of here if you have a radius beam that you use to level your fretboard you can put the radius beam upside down in the vise and simply take the nut and just level it on the radius beam that way it will follow the radius contour of the top surface of the nut anyway, and you don't have to, you know, constantly try and maintain that radius by hand with a file. Just a nice little hack there. Now I do in the very beginning need to tip this a little bit towards the treble side simply because the slots are much deeper. Well, that's not true. The slots are not deeper on the treble side. Um, the strings are just so much smaller than the bass strings that there's more bone above them to be removed. So we just need to tip, sort of angle the nut towards the treble on that top surface. And that looks pretty good. Now I'll just sand the whole thing. I should be wearing a mask for this because this bone, bone is really nasty stuff to breathe in. I'm gonna put my mask on. Yeah, bone and mother of pearl, or any shell material, are basically the worst things to breathe in. So if you're gonna be a little bit lazy with your mask, uh, at least don't do it here with bone or with pearl. Okay, let's check that out. Getting closer, I'd say I've got about a quarter on top, but I'll go a little further. 
so that I have a third sitting on top. There we go. Again, I'm not sure if you can even see that, but that is now good. All right, you know what would really be a shame at this stage to uh, wipe away one of your slots. It's totally possible, especially those tiny E string and B string slots. Totally possible that you could just be a little too aggressive and they would disappear completely. And you'd be right back uh, to the beginning then. Yeah, that's a bummer. Uh, but but um, that's why you just want to be extra mindful here. So what I'm doing now is just rounding because I was sanding flat, um, I want to bring that round back into the nut for aesthetic reasons. And also, again, for remember I talked about that clink, clink, clink sound when you're tuning up. That reduces the amount of bone that the string is rubbing against by putting that sort of angle into it. So I'm just curling like this. really no clear point that I stop here just once it looks right but at this point I'm not taking material off the very top so I don't have to worry about what I was talking about before about eliminating one of my notches accidentally okay so that looks good now I'm just gonna knock the pointy edges off of this because nobody likes pointy edges and kind of smooth through successive grits. Right now this is sanded down to 120 grit, so we can go to 220, then to 320. I could even go further, you know, 400, 600, uh, if I really want to get crazy with it. You can even polish it with a buffing wheel. There's lots you can do just to kind of shine this up at this point. But effectively, it's done. And you know what? In the next video, I am going to be stringing this up and actually playing it for the first time for you guys. So that's pretty exciting. I have never built a parlor guitar before. I've never even, I don't think, ever played a parlor guitar. It's not a guitar you typically see in a music store or anything like that. I've played like Baby Taylors and stuff like that, but that's not quite the same. So this is going to be something uh, I, I really don't even know quite what to expect when I play it. Anyway, I'm gonna do that for you guys in the next video. We'll get to hear how it sounds and we'll talk about it. All right, see you in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericshaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.